The hashtag is PRSA ICON. Okay, okay. Make sure you tell everybody what the hashtag is. Good afternoon and thank you for coming, especially given that you all walked past the sign that said put sexy back into offline communication. So it's really great that you made it this far. Uh, I'm, I'm Frank Ogan. I'm the president and CEO of the Institute for Public Relations, and it's really my privilege to, to introduce uh, today's session. The Brunick Lecture Series started uh, four years ago at the University of Maryland, and in fact, Elizabeth Toth, who heads the public relations program there, is here with us today, and she'll be up after the, the uh, speaker. But it began uh, as the uh, 40th celebration of the PRSSA chapter at the University of Maryland. Thereafter, recognizing uh, University of Maryland's leadership in public relations education, the Institute for Public Relations got involved as well. And uh, in the last two years, this lecture series has been held as a master's class within the, the PRSA International uh, Conference. Now, uh, for several years, it has been sponsored by Prime Research as this year, and uh, that company is truly a global force in communications research. Uh, it has six research uh, centers and other operations on four continents, and Mark Wiener, who's the CEO of North America for Prime Research, is a, a longtime friend and a member of the Institute's uh, Commission on Public Relations Management. Evaluation. So we thank uh, Mark Wiener, who is not here with us today, but thank him for the steady support of this. Now to introduce our speaker, uh, Bruce Berger. I have this philosophy that in life we always remember people for whatever it was they were doing when we first met them. Anything before that is unknown to us, anything after that was a side trip. So I've long known and Consider Bruce to be a practitioner and a real guiding light on employee communications. In fact, the very first time I ever spoke with him, I don't know if you remember this, but I gave him a call. Uh, I was doing in some job that I had, uh, we were trying to reinvent the whole employee communications function. And I always like to talk with few smart people as I'm doing it. I actually spent a lot of my career in employee communications, which is probably why we needed to reinvent it. But, uh, but someone said, call Bruce Berger. He'll talk to you about this. He's very smart about this. And I got him on the phone. And sure enough, we spent time talking about that. And for that reason, he's always been, for me, the ultimate guru in employee communications. Now, thereafter, after 20 years of corporate uh, uh, practice, uh, he went on to get his PhD uh, and, and uh, began to teach and has done that for quite a number of years. He continues to this day to be a trustee of the Institute for Public Relations and in fact is one of the stalwarts of our Commission on Organizational Communications and, and uh, indeed they're bringing forward a research agenda. Our whole focus at the Institute is research that matters to the practice and, and uh, we're developing I think quite a strong program in the area of organizational communication thanks to uh, Bruce and, and, and his colleagues on that body. So, after 20 years, he started to teach. He is today the Reese Pfeiffer Professor of Advertising and Public Relations at the University of uh, Alabama. Uh, he is on the board of the Planck Center, the Center for Leadership in Public Relations. Uh, he's been the, the chair of that department, and in fact, he has actually a much wider range of research interests today than just employee communications. Uh, but nevertheless, that is today's topic, uh, a look at uh, what we know about employee communications and, in fact, how do we move from knowing to doing what we know is, is the right approach. So, with that, Bruce, it's my pleasure to turn it over to you. Thank you, Frank. Uh, thanks to all of you. Good afternoon. If you can't hear me, let me know during the course of the presentation. Projection is not usually an issue for me, but if you can't hear me, uh, do let me know. I have to tell you, it's always a fine thing to stand anywhere near the shadow of uh, Jim and Lori Groom. So it's a great honor and a privilege to be here today. Uh, I want to thank the University of Maryland, the Public Relations Society of America, and the Institute for 
Public Relations for the invitation to deliver this lecture. Now, uh, I've known Jim and Lori Grooney for some years, and like many others, uh, in the practice and in education, I've been enlightened by the abundant research that they've carried out. And I've been inspired by the passion for excellence that they bring to public relations programs. In fact, I've always felt, truthfully, with excellence theory, that that was also a pretty nice gift. A gift of hope and a kind of vision for the future of what public relations might be. Now, one of their concepts of culture for communication has long resonated with me. As Frank said, uh, Frank kept talking about my years here and years there. And it makes me just an old man, <laughs> is what it makes me. Um, and it's a concept that I dealt with in practice and that I've long believed in the notion of a culture for communication. And it refers to an organizational culture that nurtures and is constituted by open communication, by two-way communication, and by an exchange of diverse ideas that people uh, can make without fear of any kind of retribution. It means a culture where leaders not only talk, but they listen, where people are recognized for achievement, and where diverse people seem to come together to, pursue, to achieve something other than satisfying a mere self-interest. This is the kind of culture, in fact, in which most of us want to work. A study by the Families and Work Institute some years ago found that an open communication environment was the single most important quality that prospective employees sought in a workplace environment. So the concept of a culture for communication is really the framework for my topic today. Employee communication, or sometimes called internal communication, organizational communication. And for me, employee communication always has three dimensions, or sort of three sides to it. The first one is the best known, and that is the formal communications in organizations which are often orchestrated by communication professionals, speeches, intranets, newsletters, and so forth. The second dimension is the communications, in fact, which occur within, among, and across work groups and units in the organization. And the third piece, which is probably the most important, it's the nonverbal communication and the behaviors of the individuals who actually send or deliver the messages. Now, most leaders claim employees are their most important asset, and they extol the importance of communication with them. But these are claims, of course, that have much greater weight than the evidence that supports them. As I wrote in a column in Public Relations Week a couple of months ago, employee communication is and always has been kind of the Rodney danger field in the field of public relations. For most um, executives, employee communication ranks third behind shareholder communication, customer communication. Our own journals in the field have relatively few studies that probe employee communication. PRSA's daily issues and trends, uh, which is something that I read religiously, is top heavy with social media developments and with the latest crises. We're blessed with many of those. Even my own students have little interest in employee communication. And I know because I survey them each fall in a management class. They tell me they want jobs in digital media, media relations, special events, not employee communication. When I ask them why, the general answer is, well, we know it's important, but it's just not very sexy. No, it's not very sexy. On the other hand, employee communication is at the center of crucial workplace issues today. Quality programs, retention of top talent, employee engagement, employee branding, and change management, for example. Now, I have to confess, when I first encountered the term some long years ago in something I was reading, the term change management, I misunderstood it. I misunderstood it so that my sort of spontaneous reaction was, Hallelujah! Praise the Lord! We're going to change management. <laughs> <laughs> my euphoria was short-lived. So this afternoon what I want to do is to make a case for the power and importance of employee communication. And I'll begin with this observation. The Chinese proverb claims that the beginning of wisdom is to call things by their right name. The beginning of wisdom is to call things by their right name. Okay, the right name for employee communication in 
too many organizations today is folly, utter folly. I use the word folly in the sense that historian Barbara Tuchman defined it 25 years ago in her book, The March of Folly. In that book, she examined four historical events, beginning with the Trojan Horse and the Trojan War, and concluding with the Vietnam War. She claimed all four events in the end were utter follies and miserable failures. For something to qualify as folly, according to Tuchman, it had to meet four conditions. It must be clearly contrary to the self-interest of the organization or group pursuing the action. It must be conducted over some period of time, not just a single burst of irrationality. It must be conducted by a number of individuals or groups, and it must have had people alive at the time who pointed out correctly why the act in question was folly. Now I think by those four conditions, there's no greater folly in too many organizations today than employee communication <coughs> practices that are used ostensibly to engage employees, build trust, and create competitive it's folly because we've known actually for a very long time what needs to be done to achieve successful employee communication. It's folly because many researchers have told us for a very long time what needs to be done. It's folly because some organizations are living exemplars of what can be done successfully. And I'm going to talk about a few of those later on. And it's folly because too many organizations still don't get it. They still don't do it. They still continue to act against their own self-interest by perpetuating failed communication programs that drive distrust and cynicism and reduce engagement and commitment. This folly to me represents the great employee communication paradox. We know what needs to be done to create cultures for communication. But too many organizations don't do it. They fail to move from knowing to doing. Over the last half century, the managerial <coughs> view of employees and their communications needs has evolved, at least theoretically, from seeing employees as one-dimensional laborers who must, must be tightly controlled and directed, to seeing them, in fact, as an important competitive advantage. Effective communication helps unleash their talents and energies. Once considered a soft skill, employee communication today is now seen as having hard business impact customer service, product quality, innovation, and other areas. In fact, this perspective is supported by a very rich body of knowledge. We know more today than we've ever known about employee communication. Hundreds of research studies, benchmarking studies, professional reports confirm the crucial links between internal communication and organizational performance. Literally 50 years of survey data by Watson Wyatt, Towers Parent, and other firms provide insights into the correlates and drivers of effective employee communication. Dozens of award-winning case studies describe successful communication practices. We celebrate them each year. A richer way of professional workshops and webinars highlight best practices. I don't know about you, but I get two or three emails every week announcing a webinar that's about best practices in employee communication. And the lineup for those usually is pretty good. So there's lots of information available. There's also a cadre of specialized consultants and professionals who are available to help organizations succeed. I've been privileged to work with and to know uh, some of these experts. They include Sue Newman at Praxair, Big Miles at TIAA Prep, Keith <coughs> Burton at Goldman Harris, Gary Grates at Edelman, Merrill McDonald at Gavin McDonald, Lou Williams, and Roger Dupree, probably the godfather of employee communication. Now they know so much. Truly, and we know so much in the field that it's virtually impossible today, I think, for communicators and executives and organizational leaders to not know the drivers of successful employee communication. But despite the vast knowledge and expertise that we have available to us today, employee levels of engagement, commitment, and trust are distressingly low, and they've been declining since the late 90s. Here are just a few of the sad facts. 63% of employees believe management lies. 
This is a Council of Communication Management study from 1995, a while ago. 56% of employees are not proud of their company leaders. Harvard study, 2006. 24% of employees would fire their boss if they could. Gallup study, 2007. From the same study, only 29% of employees are actively engaged in their work. Only 10% of employees believe their senior leaders treat employees as vital assets. And only 38% feel senior managers, managers communicate openly and honestly with them. That's from a very broad, very large uh, Towers Group Global Workforce Study 2007-2008. 21% of high potential employees, high potential employees, are disengaged from work, and 25% plan to leave their company, according to a corporate executive board study 2010. 25% of employees had less trust in management 2011 versus last year, and only 14%, 14% believe their leaders are ethical and honest. Merits research in employee engagement this year, 2011. Now, it's so bad, claim Branham and Hirschfeld in their book, Re-Engage, that, quote, many people today go to work at jobs they dislike supervised by people who don't care about them, and directed by senior leaders who appear clueless about where to take the company or the organization. Now, that's a pretty harsh indictment of the workplace today and the organizational leadership today. So, we might encounter it. We might, might counter it by arguing that, yeah, but these dismal data are all due to the current economic meltdown, which, after all, did eliminate 5 million jobs just in a <laughs> six-month period. It produced millions of long-term unemployed, and it shuttered a number of retail uh, uh, giants. Since 2008, in fact, some 72% of employees have restructured or laid off employees, employers that restructured or laid off, and many of those, of course, who kept their jobs, who still have work today, were rewarded with crushing increases in workload and stress and new responsibilities. We could also argue that our current situation has deep roots in the massive export and outsourcing of jobs in the recent decades and in the new employee tough love at best contract that's been in existence for a while. We might add the shocks to employee trust delivered in the past decade by the televised parade of CEOs and senior executives found guilty of accounting fraud and other crimes of passion, ego, and greed. It wasn't a small-scale issue. Nearly 700 companies were forced to restate their earnings in one three-year period. Now, as the three suggest, these and other striking changes, quote, destroy and damage connections between employees and organizations, between organizations and customers, and between each of us in our work groups. Now, I'm sure no one in the audience is a cynic, but a cynic might suggest that companies and organizations are now reaping what they have sown for the past 30 years. And that is a group of bitter, disengaged, and distrustful employees. So, the prevailing socio-political economic context, in fact, does help explain some of the low data yields on trust and engagement in but there's more to the story than that. There's much more to the story. Research into effective communication over the past 25 years by any number of major firms and organizations, Gallup, Watson, Wyatt, Howard Perrin, IABC Research Foundation, and other individuals, have pretty consistently highlighted 15 or so factors or drivers of successful communication. Most of these drivers, or many of them, point not so much to our formal communication that we have responsibilities to work, but rather they point to the communication skills and behaviors of senior leaders and supervisors and to the satisfaction of certain intrinsic motivations that employees have. Jim Schaefer found in a very interesting study that employees' perceptions of their organizations are influenced only a little bit, about 15%, by our formal communication. By that, I mean the newsletters, brochures, camp videos, and so forth. These perceptions are influenced more by work and team communications, 30%, and 
And they are most heavily influenced, especially by what leaders say and what they do. About 55% of them are influenced. So now I'm simplifying a bit here, but our core knowledge about employee communication is this. Research underscores that internal communication is more likely to be successful when senior leaders are visible, when they walk the talk, when they listen and respond to employee issues, when they genuinely care about employee well-being, and when they deliver salient messages that explain, that explain what's happening, why it's happening, and what it means to employees. Research underscores that internal communication is more likely to be successful when frontline managers and supervisors provide regular performance feedback, recognize employee contributions, listen and respond to employees, create development opportunities, and enable employees to act in ways that support achievement of the organization's objectives. Research underscores that internal communication is more likely to be successful when the communication system provides timely and two-way communication channels, facilitates learning and sharing of information and best practices through multiple communication channels. And today, this is especially where social media can come into play and be highly productive, and enrich the understanding of the marketplace and explain how jobs align with organizational goals. Now I have to ask, are there any real surprises on that list? Are there any real surprises? We have known those kinds of things about employee communication for quite a while. These are the factors that help build trust and spur commitment and engagement by creating a culture for communication. Research also tells, that, tells us that this actually starts, of course, at the top of the organization with the mindset and behaviors of leaders. It also requires supervisors and managers who are capable communicators and held accountable for communication. A very large recent study found that, quote, the strongest force shaping employee mobilization today is personal connection. Personal connection, which is defined as the degree to which employees understand company goals and believe they can impact those goals. The most powerful driver of uh, employees making personal connections, talk, manager and supervisor led conversation, ongoing conversation and dialogue with employees. Even with the influence of online or on-demand content today through social media and other online sources, employees still look to their manager or supervisor as the most important source of information. Senior leaders and internal communication professionals have long known these drivers. I, I firmly believe that. Yet the employee <coughs> communication paradox persists. In their excellent book, The Knowing Doing Gap, by Pfeffer and Sutton, they claim that companies spend more than $100 billion annually on training programs and on consultants to help them learn how to build competitive advantage. Some of the training sticks, but most of it doesn't. Malcolm Goldsmith, a Dartmouth business professor and a personal coach to dozens of CEOs and executives in this country, makes a similar point. He found that about one-third of executives who undergo extensive and expensive leadership training never, never do anything differently when they return to the job. Fully a third of individuals don't. So clearly, knowing isn't doing. Knowing uh, doesn't necessarily lead to doing. It isn't enough. Why? Well, there are a number of tough barriers to moving from knowing to doing. And I want to speak now briefly to four of them. There are more, but these are four that seem pretty persistent and pretty pernicious. The first one is what I call the managerial legacy. The core of management for 150 years, controls and directives, frankly, hasn't changed much in the past century, despite a lot of lift of service given to empowerment and shared decision making. There isn't truly much evidence of a flow of information up the hierarchy or the flow of decision-making and authority down the hierarchy. As a result, too many managers and leaders still view communication as a simple process of message injection. So they focus on the messages they send or have us send. 
through formal communication channels. And then they largely ignore the messages that come back to them, which in truth are the most important messages. And if you've worked in employee communication, have some responsibilities for it, you know the kind of frustrating communication cycle this produces. When leaders inject new messages, employees who re receive them often say, what in the world are they up to now? And the leaders who sent the messages, they respond by saying, why in the world don't they get it? So you have this back and forth, back and forth, just like a perpetual ping pong game of disconnect. Second, the tactics target. Some leaders and practitioners get caught up in tactics and discrete communication activities at the expense of strategies. We all do this. In a busy world, we rush to act quickly. We have to act decisively because we have to. We focus on channels and messages, and we substitute memory sometimes for thinking. Some years ago, an executive at Whirlpool struggled with how to resolve a major trust issue in his business division. The single digit single digit survey data were really grim. Few of his employees trusted him or his leadership team. So he had a solution. He undertook something and his solution was to produce a monthly newsletter entitled Trust. He produced a monthly newsletter called Trust in which he told employees repeatedly that they could and should that was his solution. Happily, the newsletter died after the first two issues. But it's a good example of how, of the kind of blinding effects that a focus on tactics can leave us with. As a military strategist once said, strategy without tactics is the slowest route to victory. Tactics without strategy is the noise before defeat. There's a lot of noise in many organizations today. <laughs> The third is the talk action syndrome. Organizations sometimes or often confuse a lot of talk, a lot of meetings, a lot of paperwork, and a torn on one way communication with action. This summer, past summer, I did some work for a firm here in Atlanta. Uh, it was dealing with a very common problem today, and that's how to improve and integrate employee communication during a time of global expansion. And the executives had decided that the way to deal with that, they had decided this at some point in the past, was to mandate an open communication system in all of their operations, which sounds great. So they led a lot of meetings for their management team. They produced brochures, they produced and watched <coughs> videos, they did some team training kinds of things. But after uh, a year, they were discouraged because all of the flurry of activity and education, nothing much seemed to have changed. Very little had seemed to have changed. They had communicated their messages through a variety of channels repeatedly, but in fact, they hadn't really acted any differently. Their behaviors were still consistent with past practices. They changed nothing else in the culture except to order the mandate. They failed to move from knowing to doing quite simply because the walk didn't match the talk. They mandated an open communication system while their very own actions continued to valorize the closed and controlled communication system of the past. Four, behavioral constipation. Now, it's difficult for me to change my behaviors, and perhaps you as well. It's difficult for everyone to change behaviors, but it's more difficult for senior leaders to change behaviors because they're used to winning, and frankly, their current behaviors are what got them <coughs> to their high-level position. So they're very reluctant to change behaviors. But as Surowiecki writes in the book, Wisdom of the Crowds, executives are just like the rest of us. And by that he means they are normally distributed. And so, like the rest of us, they can routinely overestimate their own abilities, their level of knowledge, and the likelihood that they are right. So in addition to being wrong at times, and they will be wrong just like we are at times, they don't even have any idea how long they might be. We know that everyone in the organization watches the behaviors of leaders to figure out what's expected and, in fact, what gets rewarded in that organization. 
Goldsmith, the Dartmouth professor I mentioned earlier, claims that leaders could dramatically improve their credibility and their impact in the organization if they eliminated just one bad habit. Like, for example, being a poor listener, or always having to have the last word, or too often using words and or no and but. But it seems as if some leaders haven't yet figured out what you all know. And that is that leadership is not about what you get, the responsibilities, the purpose, the power. Leadership is about what you give. Attention, direction, vision, support, inspiration, and opportunity. Now these and other barriers limit any organization's ability to change, act, and communicate effectively. Those things flow from the top down, which means that you are the center of communication. I've believed personally for many years that the most valuable contribution we can make in our organizations and in our profession lies inside our organizations in helping them move from knowing to doing and in helping them create cultures for communication. Public trust in organizations starts with employee trust in those organizations. Engagement is nurtured inside or not organizations. Our reputation with customers has its roots inside organizations. Yet as Dupree suggests, quote, we seem far more intrigued with the possibilities of information highways and electronic meeting sites out there than with humans and human information and communication needs inside our organization. And Stefan Poster, a very gifted and wildly creative uh, advertising uh, executive, puts it another way. The world is increasingly digital, he says, but people are still analog. They still need and are moved by the human word and the human touch. So to move from knowing to doing and to creating cultures for communication, I think we need to take four steps as professional communicators. First, we need to know what to do. Well, my argument this afternoon has been that we know what to do. We already know what to do. Second, convince ourselves and others to act. This, of course, is the big question, the most difficult step, and I'm going to come back to this one. Three, develop and carry out action plans. We're really good at that. As a profession, we are great at putting together and carrying out communication plans. Four, sustain the effort over time, which is difficult to do given change and turnover inside the organization. Now, unfortunately, the great data and information that we have uh, about employee communication Tell us very little about that critical step number two. How to convince leaders to create cultures for communication if they aren't already inclined to do so. Few studies address this issue. It's nearly always off stage or out of sight, even in best practice studies. Those focus on processes and programs and tactics, they don't really tell us very little about how to convince reluctant leaders of changes that need to be made. Now for me, this is the crucial gap in our research and employee communication today. How are public relations and communication <laughs> specialists able to convince otherwise reluctant or ineffective leaders and managers to change mindsets, change behaviors, and embrace employee communication? This is the biggest gap, the biggest area of knowing that we need to fill up. We need studies that do that. Truth is, we need some best practices about how to sell best practices inside our organizations. In the absence of compelling research, I want to make five suggestions or five approaches. I'll link them to other companies uh, that I think have used them pretty well to some extent. Approaches that might be taken to help move from knowing to doing. Number one, think really strategically and focus on your organization's culture and particularly on your leadership demographics. What are your leaders' existing mental models for communication? What types of appeals work with them? Ground everything in research, use coalitions, and tie strongly to organizational things. Some years ago, at Whirlpool, we undertook a major process to change outdated mental models for employee communication and basically gain budget and funding for a very ambitious global employee strategic plan. The work ran about 18 months, was based on extensive research, involved a diverse set of cross-functional, cross-cultural teams, and created a business case 
for change that was grounded in the demographics of our leadership, mostly engineers and marketers. The plan centered on the idea of using excellent communication practices and what, for them, new technologies to reduce the cycle time required for processing change in the organization. This is clearly linked to productivity, and it's an argument that engineers understand and that marketers understand. The key idea in this approach is for the professional communication folks to develop two strategic plans simultaneously. One plan is the actual plan you want to implement and sell. The second strategic plan, a parallel plan, is the strategy you develop and use to convince the decision makers to approve your actual plan. In other words, your plan is structured throughout the whole process. You're thinking simultaneously about what needs to be done and about how you're going to tie it to the demographics of your leadership. <coughs> second, link the workplace to the marketplace. Open, candid, focused communication helps employees understand what the market's saying, why it's saying it, and what leaders and employees can do together to help deal with it. Employees are critical agents, and they need to be armed with information and enabled to act. Now, in my personal opinion, FedEx has been a fine model for employee communication for quite a number of years. Their executives are very visible. They conduct a great deal of communication training at multiple levels in the organization. They have metrics in place to measure engagement and a number of other things. They listen to customers and employees pretty well. And they link employees to customers through a very thorough understanding of the marketplace. Southwest Air also uses this approach very successfully, down to the types of personalities they hire and the autonomy that they provide to employees to act in the interests of their customers. They rigorously follow a simple set of business practices and focus on three basic measures. We probably all know what they are. Since they're simple and they've been communicated, on-time departures, lost luggage, and customer satisfaction measures. Now, I'm sure they have a lot more than that. They must have a huge dashboard of measures somewhere. But those are the three that count. Those are the three that count. And those are what give clear line of sight to employees in terms of where their work needs to take them. Everybody knows what Southwest Airlines does. They're very open about it. Uh, they've been studied numerous times. Yet, other airlines basically seem unable to replicate what they do. It's just like the Toyota production system, which is probably the most thorough, thoroughly studied production system in the world. But companies that have studied it basically can't replicate it either. Why? Well, because the communication practices and the cultures in which the other, which the other companies have are not as they are in Toyota and Southwest. It's the culture and the leadership that links so closely to and frames support of communication. Uh, okay, three, related to workplace and marketplace, link your appeals and activities to quality programs or disciplines like Six Sigma or Lean. These approaches may, in fact, awaken managers and leaders to the power of a communication culture because sustained quality programs actually force people to think differently over longer periods of time. And in doing so, long entrenched habits and mental models may break or change. A classic example here is GE and their well-known workout program. That reflects this approach. It was created in the, the late 1980s as a way to involve large numbers of employees in systematic process improvement. And in small groups and large town hall meetings, employees came together to discuss real business problems and how to solve them or resolve them. This approach created the basis for a sustained dialogue inside that company that moved ideas into action and helped them move from knowing to doing. The dialogue sustained over some period of time tied to the concept of quality. By the late 1990s, the workout became, workout became the basis for GE's push into Six Sigma quality programs, which was the basis then the foundation for their more recent work on digitization and e-business. Number four. Base your appeals on company values and bring them to life through executive action and behaviors. Make the cultural transparency argument. I have to admit, values have always been a little bit squishy. A little bit squishy. They're more or less the same from one company to another. And the trick is, do you live the values? And if you do, then you have a great opportunity.
opportunity and value to create the kind of communication culture that you want. In the book I mentioned by Pfeffer and Sutton, they take a close look at, at Men's Warehouse, the tailored clothing retailer. One of that company's key values is to develop employees and their skills to make them successful as individuals. George Zimmer, who's chairman and founder of Men's Warehouse, claims that they're really in the people business, not in the suit business in retail. It's a low wage, wage industry and business with relative, actually high turnover. So Zimmer believes in giving employees a second or even a third chance the first time they get caught shoplifting clothes from their home store. It gives them a second chance or a third chance. This inspires gratitude and loyalty among employees. It certainly reduces costs of turnover, and it powerfully communicates the value of employee development. Recreation Equipment, another retailer, also espouses the importance of employee development and strong support for diversity. Now, the company brought these values to life by providing management training to many people in the organization and providing health care benefits to part-time employees. The company also was one of the first in this country to provide life partner benefits to employees along with financial assistance for adopting parents or children. Number five, appeal to employees' intrinsic motivations, create events, activities, or approaches that capitalize on these motivations to drive change. Uh, I'm going to pull some examples here from a recent book by Daniel Pink called Drive. It's all about intrinsic motivations, and it's a, it's a fast read. Um, it's a good read, I think, uh, for us. IBM has carried out its virtual innovation jams for more than a decade. Hosted initially by the CEO who invited all 335,000 IBMers to participate, the online jams are simply electronic brainstorming sessions to develop ideas to move the company ahead. The first jam lasted three days, generated more than 37,000 comments by 53,000 employees who took part. The employees then prioritized the idea, and IBM backed up this action with $100 million to act on some of those best ideas. Using a similar approach, Best Buy received more than 900 cost-cutting ideas after launching its Blue Shirt Nation social networking site for employees. British Telecom attracted more than 16,000 employees worldwide to collaborate on its wiki to help solve real problems the company is facing. These are three of a number of growing examples in this area, and I think they're pretty instructive with respect to employee communication. Each involved an invitation to employees to help their organization solve problems. There was a very clear line of sight for what they were doing. Employees were empowered to talk and to share their ideas. Their ideas were listened to, they were recorded, they counted. Then some of the ideas were selected for activation and the company moved on. So employees engaged, they made a difference, they were recognized, and guess who benefited? The company benefited from this work. The cases also illustrate some examples uh, in which, or, or of how social media can really help employees connect. <coughs> autonomy is another intrinsic motivation, and I use autonomy to refer to the idea that, uh, of acting with some choice, being able to experiment with work and with ideas. 3M has followed the idea of hiring good people and providing them with some autonomy for a long period of time, more than half a century. Since the 1940s, technical employees at 3M have been allowed to spend 15% of their work week working on ideas, working on their own ideas, things that were important to them. Many of the inventions the company relies on have come from this autonomy time, including one of their most famous products that we both love and hate, Post-it notes, and a whole bunch of Post-it products that followed that. Now, though this was highly successful, and as well known, very few other companies have followed this model. One company that did, however, has become rather successful, Google. Engineers at Google are allowed to spend 20% of their time, or one workday each week, working on a side project of their own choosing. Clearly, <coughs> more than half of the company's products and new offerings have come from autonomy time. Uh, you've heard of some of these, Google News, Google Talk, Gmail, so forth and so on, coming from autonomy time. Think about that with respect to your own work unit. What might you do in a work unit or department to take advantage of autonomy time? 
And I know everybody says, ah, I'm too busy. I can't do it. I can't think. I can't breathe. I'm too busy. But think about the possibilities of what might be done from time to time. So anyway, at this point, I'm sure some of you are thinking, what in the world do any of these things have to do with this really communication? Well, the answer is pretty simple. They have everything to do with employee communication. Think back to the 15 or so factors and drivers of effective employee communication that I mentioned earlier. The cases I just highlighted are a good example for a number of those factors. The power of listening, vastly underrated. The power of listening. Providing opportunity for employees to share ideas and questions. The opportunity to make a difference. And especially, especially the power of actions versus words. Employee communication certainly is the formal communication in our organizations. But that's only the smallest part. Even more, it's communications that cross and connect work teams and groups. And most of all, it's the words, the listening skills, <coughs> the behaviors of leaders and frontline supervisors and managers. Excellent public relations with groups and publics outside the organization begins with excellent communication inside the organization. As professionals and as academics, I think we have obligations to stop the folly, or at least to try to reduce it. We have obligations to help our organizations move from knowing to doing. And we have obligations to push back on people, on practices, and on structures that impede the formation of cultures for communication. We also have obligations, and I firmly believe, the corresponding power through our own behaviors and practices to model the way. We can be exemplary, exemplary listeners. We can engage. We can inspire. We can be accessible. We can be visible. We can recognize and thank others for their many contributions. Who knows? Our own behaviors just might be the tipping point for moving your organization from knowing to doing. And at this point, I'm going to stop talking, and you're going to start talking. Uh, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions you have, but frankly, personally, I would much rather hear from some of you, some of your stories about how you are being successful or how you have been successful in terms of moving organizations from knowing to doing. That is the big, tough barrier. Okay, so if anyone is willing to share a story or an experience or an idea, I'd love to hear. So questions, comments, please. I will. I work for a public library. Three years ago, we were faced with really serious budget cuts by most public libraries in the country. And um, our assistant directors elected to move the responsibility for deciding where those cuts were going to come down to library branch managers and down to the staff in the branches. And that had the, um, the double result uh, letting staff understand exactly what we were facing and how crucial it was and also coming up with some really good ideas that um, helped cushion some of what might be really awful. And we were able to uh, save most of our employees and work through job cuts through attrition and eliminating vacant positions. Um, and it just it gave everybody much more insight into the process. Thank you for sharing that story uh, about a library that was going through budget cuts, magic, uh, massive budget cuts as a lot of organizations are today, and how it was decided uh, by leadership there to push down decision making in the organization to the lower uh, level uh, or, or to, the, to, to the marketplace in a sense, and let people at the low, lowest levels uh, the practice levels decide where those cuts would come and how they would be done. And as a result, um, jobs were saved, appropriate cuts were made, but it's a great example of pushing authority down the hierarchy. Uh, thank you very much for sharing that. I appreciate it. I just have a question. Yes, ma'am. Is anybody doing any work into best practices and communicating best practices <laughs> to upper management? If anybody's doing, raise your hands, anybody who's doing research about how to communicate best practice, how, how to, what are the best practices for communicating best practices to leaders?
couple couple hands going up here. Look, uh, this is an area that I'm utterly fascinated with. There are a couple of professionals uh, that are very interested as well. If you have an interest in pursuing this area, this gap in employee communication, in terms of how we convince, how we get through that step two from knowing to doing, I'd love to talk with you for a minute afterwards, get a business card, because this is an area where we can work together if you want to. Please. Well, well that's a, a, a question on that very point. I've, I've paid attention to literature on this topic for many years, and I think you, I really appreciate the comprehensiveness of your own capture of a very large near consensus body of knowledge. But part of that body of knowledge is around the business case and 